Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us for this important uh, webinar that is designed to uh, inform you of several different updates relative to uh, the registry. Um, and we've got a great uh, group of people expert in these various areas, representing both the American College of Cardiology and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Uh, uh, the two organizations that have uh, put together the TVT registry uh, that now is approaching its uh, 10th year anniversary. And we uh, uh, want you all to feel uh, free to ask questions. And the Q&A function is the way to do that. And uh, we'll have a period at the end of these presentations where you can uh, hopefully have your question answered. And if we can't get to everyone's questions, we'll try to do so offline. So to start, uh, the first topic uh, that we want to address is uh, about COVID. Uh, the second will be about the new uh, minimum data set for the TAVR module. The third is about the mitral national coverage decision or determination. Uh, then we'll have public reporting and I'll introduce each speaker before uh, these various topics are uh, dealt with. And I will request all of you to feel free to submit your questions after each uh, presentation. So COVID, yes, we all have COVID fatigue and but it's an important topic and let me discuss some aspects of that relevant to the TBT uh, uh, registry specifically uh, we want to start gathering uh, data so COVID's clearly had a disruptive effect on many people's lives including those people we care for who have out their heart disease I think we can all cite examples of people who've delayed uh, treatment uh, and sometimes uh, missed the opportunity to have uh, the treatment. Finally, uh, COVID adds to the comorbid states that uh, these patients carry with them and can have a major effect on outcome. So we'll talk about uh, that uh, subsequently. Uh, and this update of including and the data collection forms, whether or not a patient has had COVID is really for all the data collection forms in the different uh, modules, uh, the TAVR module, the two micro modules and the new tricuspid module. So there'll be three opportunities to add whether your patients had COVID. It can be done if known when the patient comes for their baseline evaluation and you submit that data collection form, when the patient comes back for the procedure, if there's that knowledge gained that they've been tested positive for COVID, it can be added there. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, the follow-up data collection forms will have this uh, entry added, both 30 day and one year. And the one year is particularly noteworthy because it's a means by which we can gather data who've been treated in 2020, who subsequently had COVID that may make a significant uh, impact on their uh, condition. Uh, these data elements can be seen as of April 23rd on the updated uh, data collection forms. So there are two main purposes uh, that the data will be, how the data will be used. The first in, is assessing COVID impact. And already uh, we've seen this in terms of a significant decline in patients having transcatheter valve therapies. We have not seen a makeup rebound effect. And so, therefore there's a deficit in treating these individuals who may have severe uh, valvular heart disease. And uh, we all worry about uh, 
some of the impact may be uh, increased mortality from not being able to uh, be treated. Secondly, we're actively discussing once this data is, is gathered about how to exclude these patients uh, from uh, quality metrics and public reporting of site performance uh, because this is a unique circumstance and some sites may have uh, major impacts on many of their patients that uh, is really uh, out of their control in terms of the quality of care they provide uh, for TAVR. So if you have any further questions, uh, please uh, add these uh, to your Q&A function and we'll try to get to them um, at the end. Next, uh, Shriek from Malapali and Kim Gabon are two of our uh, dedicated members of the TVT uh, team who will present the issue of the creation of a minimum data set for TAVR and subsequently other modules. Uh, Shriek, you want to take over? Thanks, John. Um, next slide, please. So I think it's important um, for everyone to uh, think about really all of the stakeholders and all of the functions of the TBT registry. So you can see some of the stakeholders here on the side, but really the TBT is meant to provide, of course, hospital quality feedback and the creation of risk models to aid that. Um, the fulfillment of the CMS national coverage decision requirements, post-market reporting and surveillance as required by the Food and Drug Administration, and of course, generation of evidence we have examples of that, such as TAVR in the mitral position and research as well. And it's important to realize that with all of these functions, years ago when the registry was started in 2011 and 12, uh, individuals came together with these functions in mind and really tried to create a data set that, uh, that served all of these functions. Next slide, please. I think it's also important to realize that we were at a different sort of time and place with regards to commercial TAVR in 2011 and 2012, it was relatively new. There was still a lot unknown about TAVR. Of course, at that point in time, we were doing prohibitive and then high risk patients. And certainly now the situation has evolved to all risk groups and we have a lot more experience. And so we've seen the evolution of the field. And of course, we believe that the data set needs to evolve with that. And additionally, we've really heard the feedback um, from all of you from clinicians, from um, data managers, that there is a, a somewhat of a burden associated with the data element extraction um, that has to go on. So we've undertaken this process where we've tried to come up with a reduced uh, or basic data set that has evolved over time with the needs of the registry as TAVR has evolved. And the idea is to try and increase data efficiency and therefore all, also increase data quality. Next slide. So uh, just to, to step back for a second about the core minimum data set uh, concept, what is that really? Well, as I mentioned, the registry has multiple functions, quality applications, regulatory applications, clinical applications, and the, this core or basic data set is really that, that red area in between all of these functions. What is it that um, is necessary for all of these functions and can we define that? And the idea is that we would go about defining that through a unanimous consensus uh, process. I think it's important also to realize when we define this minimum data set, it's not meant to be quote unquote comprehensive for all of the possible functions um, of the registry or of the data. And we'll get to that a little bit towards the end. Next slide. So really what we would like to get to uh, and what we'll describe in a second here is two pathways for um, data um, submission um, within the uh, TBT registry. And we'll, we'll focus mostly right now on the TAVR module. There will be this core minimum data set pathway. Also, you've heard the term basic data set, and there'll be this comprehensive data set. And you can see it with the image on the left that the core or basic data set is really a subset of the comprehensive uh, data set, which is found within the uh, TAVR 3.0 module. Next slide. 
And to do this, as I mentioned, it's a, it was a kind of unanimous consensus process. We really wanted to be inclusive and make sure that all viewpoints were at least taken into account. And so you can see here some of the individuals that all were involved, but I think it's important to point out that within this list are data managers, healthcare executives, researchers, clinicians, surgeons, and uh, interventional cardiologists. Um, and so we tried to make sure we had uh, input from all of those groups. Next slide. And as we went through this process of looking at the data elements and trying to decide which ones need to be within the basic data set, there were several key um, considerations taken into account. So if you look on the left of the slide, reasons for inclusion. I mean, clearly, if we look at the, uh, the, the functions of the registry, quality assessment is, is really number one there, high on the list. And there, we needed to make sure that we kept those data elements that not only help to provide sites with data necessary for quality assessment, but also help to produce the risk-adjusted models that we've developed over the years to feed back to, to sites. Um, and some examples of this would be uh, that we kept, for instance, the five-meter walk, which is an important marker of, of frailty within our, our models. Um, additionally, we had we needed to keep elements um, that helped to uh, satisfy the CMS NCD. And here I'll just point out one particular element, which is the KCCQ. It's certainly within CMS's mandate to ensure that all of their beneficiaries uh, have access to therapies which improve the quality of their lives. And the KCCQ is the primary way in which we can assess that within the registry. And of course, we also needed to keep elements that were important to fulfilling uh, FDA reporting. On the right, you can see some of the general buckets or reasons why certain elements were put in the comprehensive data set as opposed to uh, in the basic data set. Things you'll see some uh, there are remnants of early TAVR or specifically elements that were more applicable in the early phases of TAVR nearly 10 years ago than they are now among some of these other reasons. Next slide. So in summary, after the process, we uh, came up with a basic data set or a core minimum data set that represented about 60% of the original uh, TVT TAVR 3.0 uh, module. And that 60% is about 132 data elements. For those that are interested, it breaks down to about 45 baseline or demographic slash comorbidity elements, 16 baseline laboratory slash imaging test elements, 11 procedural elements, 48 um, outcome elements, and 12 follow-up laboratory or imaging tests. And that left about another 84, 85 um, elements that will remain within the comprehensive uh, data set. Next slide. So to come back here again to this um, uh, pathway that I showed, what are really the benefits um, in terms of following a, a data submission with the core minimum data set slash basic data set versus comprehensive? So with the basic data set, you will certainly have access to all of the feedback metrics that you have been getting in addition to the risk models. It will fulfill the CMS NCD requirements. And of course, it will fulfill the uh, FDA's needs for post-market uh, reporting. I would also point out, however, there are reasons to consider and uh, follow with the comprehensive data set submission. So in the future, there are plans for uh, appropriate use criteria feedback. And additionally, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there are uh, quality groups and quality initiatives across the country that are uh, planning on uh, following the comprehensive data submission uh, in, in order to have improved and enhanced data quality efforts. I'll just give the example of the Michigan group, uh, which has a longstanding history of uh, doing these types of efforts and improving care within the state of Michigan. Next slide. So in summary, we've tried to uh, evolve the data set with the evolution of the field of TAVR and be responsive to the feedback we've heard from all of you uh, to try and decrease the burden of data collection while still maintaining the important and unique uses of the data uh, and analyses within the TBT registry. And the minimum core data set or basic data set that we're introducing here really is a living entity. And we expect that over time that may continue in to uh, evolve as the field of TAVR evolves as well. Next slide. So I, I wanna um, 
uh, introduce Kim Gabon here and, uh, and ask Kim um, to give some comments about the process um, and, uh, and what her thoughts were with this and her involvement. Thank you, Sharik. And yes, this, this is essentially a success story. So, so as we know from the beginning, the registry uh, has had several unique functions and serves as a broader, to a broader stakeholder group. So there's a lot of folks looking at this and, and gaining from this. And all of it has been built off of the hard work that has taken at place at the site level, the clinicians, the coordinators, the data abstractors, the data managers, and as a result of all of this, tremendous work has been done to provide things such as risk-adjusted outcome models, um, quality assessment tools, performance models. It's helped to mature the therapy, mature the patient care and delivery, and mature the registry. And now has come a time to pause and say, do we still need now what we needed then? And I've been very honored to participate in this project because what I can attest to is that with every data element, uh, there, the time was taken to say, you know, Kim or Karen Hardy, who was also on this, or Joan, those of us who are, on the, are more on the front lines, is this reasonable data to collect and are there any significant barriers? So I was very honored to take part in this project. And what, it came, what came out was essentially two options. So, so now how can the registry best serve the site? So you have two options. You have the basic, which are the highlighted pieces on the form, um, which still uh, allows you to do everything that you need to meet CMS requirements, to be eligible for public reporting, and to be eligible for accreditation. And so that might be best for some sites. So for example, a newer site that maybe doesn't have the staffing availability to, to do the comprehensive or to do the full data set, this might be preferential to them. Or perhaps a site who suddenly has an uptick in growth that says, my goodness, we need to hire another data abstractor. But until then, we're going to do the basic data set and then convert to full. Uh, but this is a discussion that takes place on site specific. Now, the full data set, which is what we have been doing, some sites might offer that. These might be sites that have uh, separate quality projects or regional quality projects, as Shriek mentioned, or academic centers that use this or sites that say, you know, we don't know what we wanna do with this yet, we wanna continue this data repository for future use and ongoing use. And so the, the, the kind of the take home message for this piece is recognizing that there are two options, the basic and the full, the option to go between the two and the option to do the basic plus some of the full and still get metrics reported out. But above all, the most important piece is to take this information and share it with your team, or if you are on the heart team call today, that this is the decision made by the heart team altogether. And, and, and that's the best way to proceed with using this information to its best. Thanks, Kim. I think those are really um, right on, spot on comments. Thanks so much. And I'll just end with um, this slide here, which is just as we've um, taken on this process for the Taver data set, we are in the process of doing the same for the mitral um, component as well as the tricuspid component. Certainly those areas are a little bit different. Mitral especially is actively evolving. Tricuspid is really just at the very beginning. And so uh, we'll see that those data sets will look a little bit different in terms of uh, how uh, uh, extensive the basic data uh, elements are. Thanks, John. Well, thank you very much, Kim and Reed and all others who really volunteer their time for uh, this national effort to improve the quality of care of our patients. And now is the time to submit any questions you have for Kim and Shriek on this important uh, topic. Next, we'll talk about the mitral national coverage determination, which has uh, been a topic of extending over quite some time, involving uh, an amazing involvement of people uh, with national policy decisions. And no one is better uh, in terms of understanding what happened and uh, where we're going with this than Dr. Michael Mack. So thank you, Mike, for joining us. Um, thanks, John. Sure appreciate the uh, opportunity of participating in this uh, webinar. As John has alluded to, one of the most common questions we got over the past year and a half was uh, when, were, uh, when was, were, was the NCD gonna be issued for um, 
for mitral since there was FDA approval of mitroclip for functional MR. Uh, and we were as opaque as, uh, it was as opaque to us as it was to you. Uh, we were very much in the dark and we had no idea. And that leads to my disclaimer here is that I do not work for CMS uh, and I am not an expert in health policy. Uh, but due to the fact that um, I've kind of been with the TVT registry since the beginning, uh, there have been uh, a, a lot of health policy issues that we have dealt with. So if you could go to the next slide, Carol. Uh, way back at the beginning, uh, which is uh, late 2011, um, uh, the professional societies were approached by FDA and CMS and asked if they would help build a registry to um, uh, help monitor the introduction of TAVR at the time. And uh, they told us that that would be covered by uh, an NCD. And I had no idea what an NCD was at the time, um, but what it meant was national coverage determination, which means for a device or procedure uh, that is covered by the national coverage determination. You do not need to go to your local MAC or your Medicare administrative contractor, which is a private insurance company that says, yes, you can do it or no, you can't. There's universal coverage for the procedure across the United States for all Medicare beneficiaries. And I know all of you for, for procedures have dealt with your uh, local MACs that do not have national coverage determination. And that's what's called local LCD or local coverage determination. And indeed most procedures that are covered by Medicare uh, are, uh, are not covered by an, an NCD. So an NCD is important in terms of being able to get reimbursement for FDA approved procedures. Next slide. So this was the original uh, uh, NCD uh, that was issued in 2014 that covered transcatheter mitral valve repair. Uh, and it was based on a limited FDA approval of MitraClip for high or prohibitive risk patients with um, um, mitral regurgitation. Uh, next slide. And this is, uh, you can go back one. Yeah, this is some of the uh, um, uh, indications uh, of, uh, that were uh, included in it. Uh, it had to be an FDA approved indication and you had to participate in coverage with evidence develop, which meant that all the questions regarding the procedure will not answered yet. So therefore CMS needed to acquire additional evidence to determine whether there was a benefit given to Medicare beneficiaries. It was also not covered for the treatment of mitral regurgitation when it was not furnished with coverage with evidence developed meant, or when it was not given for an FDA approved uh, uh, indication. Uh, and the, again, the indication was high or prohibitive risk uh, DMR, and it meant you had to participate in a registry. Next slide. Um, other parts of this is that all cases uh, must be uh, submitted to a national database that included a number of criteria and the STS TVT registry, which was built specifically for these applications, uh, uh, met this criteria uh, and hence had become the, the database that was used by CMS, which is one of the many applications that Kim and Sreek just told you about. Next slide. So this is uh, data uh, that will uh, be coming from an, uh, an upcoming uh, 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 publication that shows the, uh, through the first quarter of 2020, the etiology of mitral regurgitation in the TVT registry. And you can see that uh, about 62% of the current procedures are for degenerative mitral regurgitation. 
21% uh, were for functional mitral regurgitation, 11% were mixed. I'm still not quite sure to this day what a mixed uh, disease is since you are either functional or degenerative. Uh, but be that as it may, there was an off, uh, there is a lot of off-label use uh, of MitraClip uh, in the TVT registry, uh, even before uh, the uh, updated NCD was issued. Next. So this is the updated NCD. Uh, you'll notice that it was issued January 19th, 2021. There's a couple of things that are notable about this. Uh, one is that CMS has changed uh, the uh, definition of, or the term from TMVR to TEER or TEER, standing for transcatheter edge to edge repair. Uh, and, and I must say, I kind of like it. I think uh, uh, CMS did a good thing here uh, in being very, uh, being much more specific about uh, uh, what uh, the procedure actually is. Also of note is that uh, TAVR also got named by CMS way back at the beginning also, when it was called TAVI everywhere else in the world. So uh, kudos to uh, CMS for uh, naming this procedure uh, TIER, which I think is a great name. Next slide. So, um, so uh, TIER is covered uh, again with the provision of coverage with evidence development, which was a, a concern for a while, whether, uh, uh, whether uh, CMS had the ability to ask for this. And it's covered for the treatment of symptomatic, moderate or severe or severe functional mitral regurgitation with a number of other criteria that you see listed there. These are basically all the inclusion criteria of the COAP trial. So the idea is that you have to be on optimal guideline directed medical therapy uh, and evaluated by a uh, physician specializing in heart failure to determine that uh, uh, in order to be covered by CMS. Next slide. So uh, in summary, functional mitral regurgitation is now covered by a national coverage determination. Uh, coverage with evidence development uh, is a requirement for coverage, and that means participation in the registry. And the TMVR is now called TIER. So uh, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to you, John. Thank you, Mike, for that very clear explanation of what is so important to our patients. And you can see the data completeness and accuracy of what you submit on the patients you treat does have an impact for coverage with evidence development. Uh, so uh, please uh, continue to do the great jobs many of you are, are doing. And once again, think of questions you have after Dr. Mack's presentation and submit them via the Q&A function. The next topic is obviously another very important topic of public reporting uh, from the TVT registry. Uh, now we're discussing that in the sense of transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And there is no one better to discuss public reporting and what underlies it and the experience of the STS than Dr. David Shaheen. So David, please take over. Great, thanks so much, John. Carol, next slide, please. So we'll quickly run through some of the, the nuts and bolts about how uh, you need to sign up for uh, public reporting and what that public reporting will look like. Uh, Consenting uh, for public reporting opened on March 1st, will close on the 30th of uh, April. Uh, you may only consent during the consenting period and need to have uh, a signature of both a surgeon and a cardiologist. These consents uh, extend in perpetuity unless they're revoked, which you may do at any time. And if you do revoke it, uh, your consent, you'll need to reconsent. This uh, just shows the um, uh, STS uh, ACC TVT registry site 
with a public reporting uh, tab uh, and a hyperlink uh, to the consent form. Uh, next. Uh, this uh, shows the uh, STS public reporting with uh, what will be a link uh, to the TVT uh, registry uh, as well. This public uh, website will be available to the public uh, in late summer, early fall, uh, housed on the STS public reporting page with a link to the NCDR portal. Next, please. So what are the uh, criteria for reporting? Uh, first, uh, you have to uh, be a registry uh, participant for three years uh, and your site must have submitted a case uh, to the TBT registry prior to the first date in the reporting period. Um, your site must have performed uh, 60 or more TAVRs within the 36 month reporting time frame, and you need to have 90% or greater completeness on the baseline uh, KCCQ five meter walk. Uh, and event status uh, with green or yellow data quality reports. Just uh, going back for a second to the reporting period, I just wanna mention that uh, for some logistical reasons, uh, it is not clear uh, today whether um, the reporting period will commence on uh, January 1st of uh, 2018 or October 1st of 2017. Uh, we are working to resolve that issue and we'll let you uh, know uh, very shortly. Sites that don't meet the 36 month uh, time requirement or the 60 case uh, requirement will still be able to re publicly report uh, their volumes. And we'll show you an example of that in a second. Uh, sites not meeting the 90% completeness requirement or the data quality submission requirement uh, will not be able to publicly report uh, period. Um, and this excludes patients reported in TBT registry sponsored research studies. Next slide, please. The reporting metrics, which we'll show in a minute, uh, include the date of your first uh, TAVR at your institution, the cumulative volume since program inception, the average annual volume for the particular reporting period, uh, the exact dates of the reporting period, the number of eligible procedures during that reporting period, uh, the TAVR 30-day composite score, including your site score and the range of scores um, uh, for the overall cohort, and then a composite rating, one, two, or three stars. Next slide, please, Carol. Uh, this just shows um, uh, the landing page, which is a listing of all sites who have consented uh, and meet reporting requirements. Each site then has a hyperlink uh, to its specific data. Next slide, please. So this is what a, uh, the reporting page would look like for a site that meets all inclusion criteria. Uh, you can see that the date of the first TAVR uh, is there. The cumulative volume is recorded, the average annual volume for uh, uh, the reporting period uh, dates of the reporting period, the eligible procedures, your composite score, and your composite rating. Next slide, please. This would uh, what, be what the page looks like for a site meeting uh, all inclusion criteria except uh, the pre-January 2018 first case requirement or 60 minimum cases. Again, this uh, presumes that uh, that reporting period will begin January of 2018, which is still uh, uh, somewhat up in the air. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the date of the first TAVR is available, as well as the cumulative volume uh, since program inception. So it at least provides some uh, important information for uh, anybody uh, wishing to find out about the program. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll turn it back to John. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. <clears throat> John, you're on mute, I think, Tavino. Thanks, Vino. Yes, I was muted. Uh, and uh, so thank you, David. That was a great overview. And uh, please uh, make sure your sites uh, make a decision of whether to public report or not. And for all attendees of this webinar, 
Uh, please think about any questions you may have and submit them through the Q&A function on the bottom of the page. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, we're ready for uh, an open uh, discussion. And I'm glad Dr. Farani, my co-chair has uh, joined us. He's been busy uh, delivering uh, care to one of his patients. So, uh, you know, are you, are you there now? Yeah, John, thank you so much. Um, sorry guys, I, I joined about 3.05, so I was a little behind, stuck in a little emergency that the patient's doing well. So. Um, so I think that we'll just start with some um, round robin with some questions. I've been, um, when I first joined in, I had uh, some questions. I did lose them when I rejoined, uh, but I think we have enough to go on. And so um, David, since you, you gave an unbelievably uh, great, uh, succinct um, presentation on yours, maybe we'll start with yours. And Joan, uh, and uh, <clears throat> Joan, you're, you're on, Carol's on, Barb, uh, and others like Sean or Brian are on. Uh, I'll ask you to chime in also. Uh, so one question that kind of has just come up, I think it's important is, David, this will go towards you. Is there a connection between the U.S. News World Report and the TBT public reporting? Can you help us out with that a little bit? Uh, I think the question is, uh, we don't exactly know for sure uh, at this point. Uh, I don't know if uh, Carol or Joan want to comment on that, but I think uh, this all uh, remains a bit up in the air right now. Uh, and we don't have, uh, we don't, we're not able to control what U.S. News uh, does. Uh, Carol, Joan? Hi, can you hear me? This is Joan. Yeah, can we, can we go to a, maybe a gallery? If we can stop these presentations, we can hit to a gallery view, which would be great. There you go, perfect. Joan, you wanna, you wanna tackle that a little bit? Sure, uh, and, and that's a great question. A lot of sites are very um, interested in that answer and, and I guess there's some confusion or um, uh, you know, what is, what's the, the difference? And what we have been telling sites is that certainly the TVT registry in launching public reporting is using registry data and as, as what we know from a prior webinar that we co-hosted with the folks at US News and World Report, they as with all of their uh, production of uh, best hospital edition, look at uh, claims data, I believe. So it is, it is a little bit different and the endpoints are different. Um, we in public reporting, as hopefully you all know, use a hierarchical model, a risk model, a comorbidity and mortality uh, model. And it looks at stroke, uh, kidney injury requiring dialysis, major and life-threatening bleed, stroke, mortality. I think I've hit them all. Um, whereas some of the endpoints that US News used were, were different and certainly that could be um, changed as they continue to report best Haver hospitals. So U.S. News did publish in their best hospital issue last July, the methodology along with best TAVR programs and we'll be releasing our best, our public reporting, not best, but our public reporting star rankings as of October, 2021 using registry data. I hope that helps. And I, I can just follow up a little bit and tell you that if you look at, uh, and you can get this online, it's published by U.S. News. If you look at their common procedures and conditions report, uh, they actually present a cross tabulation for uh, STS cabbage and AVR, surgical AVR results versus uh, their own model. And there are very major uh, differences between the classification uh, in uh, the US news model and the STS model. Um, they have many more uh, high and low outliers. One of the reasons for that is they typically use, for many of their statistical determinations, a 75% uh, confidence interval, which is quite non-standard and really allows for a one out of four chance of being a false positive. So there are many methodologic differences between their approach, uh, at least for uh, cardiac surgery and um, and what we do in STS, and I suspect the same will be true uh, for TVT. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, David and Joan. I appreciate that. Anybody else um, want to comment on that? On that very important question, because we we actually discussed this quite a bit in our own executive calls, 
And because we don't have anybody from U.S. News and World Report on, it's it's uh, difficult for us to tell you exactly what they're going to do because their their um, their uh, their policies change on a year by year basis. Um, so, Mike we're, Mike Mac, we're going to jump to you for a second here. Why it says here? Uh, why are two providers um, and uh, for anesthesia and for a TE? And why is this not for other, for instance, TAVRs and are CRNAs okay? And so the question really is, is that, you know, how strict will this NCD be for people who are putting people to sleep in TEs? Is there really any, any answer to that, Mike, or is that just a tough one to answer? Well, I, I think you're right, Vino. It is a, it is a tough one to uh, answer. And I think you've got to do what's best in your local institution. I think that the important point here is that expertise with transesophageal echo uh, is necessary for efficacious performance of, um, you know, of uh, uh, a mitra clip uh, procedure. And, and CMS just doesn't pull these criteria out of the air. They're all evidence-based on, on what comes out of society guidelines and the evidence-based in practice. So, um, but uh, hard to determine, you know, what uh, compliance is going to have to be on that. Yeah. No, look, first of all, I want to say, you know, John, we're looking at over uh, close to 700 participants on this. We've got a lot of, a lot of comments and some of these Q and A's, I want you to know that, Joan, uh, Carol, myself, John, and others on the steering committee will answer those. These are being saved. So some of these we won't be able to get to in the next 19 minutes, but feel assured that we'll email you back uh, if we don't get to some of these. There's some really good ones on bleeding uh, that uh, Ms. Gorman has put together and, and things like that. We might not get to all of them, but I wanted to just assure everybody that we'll get to you eventually. Um, so I'm going to, John, this is going to go towards you. Uh, why not lower the HCCQ uh, and the, um, and David also for you, uh, and the uh, five meter walk test thresholds for public reporting uh, because we've had problems with COVID difficulties in performing this in the last year. Why keep that bar for public reporting still high, understanding the stuff that John just presented that it was tough to get these patients back for COVID. So maybe John and David, you guys want to tackle that? Well, I'll start with the easy part. Um, I feel your pain. It is a, a true challenge in the last year uh, for uh, getting follow-up on these uh, patients who clearly are uh, trying to avoid becoming infected. Um, now, some things can be done over the phone, and the KCCQ is one. And so that uh, really uh, is an opportunity uh, to adapt to the um, uh, realities of the difficulties of people coming in uh, for clinic visits. Uh, so that's uh, part of uh, the answer. Uh, Dave, do you want to talk about yeah. uh, thresholds and why they're used and what we possibly could do and the downs and upsides of each? Well, I, I think in a, in a, particularly for measures that are being uh, publicly reported, uh, there is nothing more important than the, than the credibility and integrity of those data. And uh, uh, without uh, very high standards for those data, they aren't going to be believed. Uh, people will question the results. So um, I uh, firmly believe that uh, those thresholds should be maintained. And, uh, you know, it may mean, for example, a, a program that's had a particularly tough time because of COVID, maybe they won't meet the requirements and be eligible uh, during uh, this early uh, reporting period that includes uh, COVID. But I'd rather have some institutions excluded rather than take the risk of having bad data. I think we're committed to data integrity. Okay, thanks, Shriek. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about you. You're next. You've got a couple that that are, that are interesting to you. So, um, one, um, Shriek, I actually, I was just texting back and forth with Joan a little bit. Uh, one is um, on um, I'm, the questions are coming in so fast. I'm having to refine this one. Um, this is a good question about bleeding, and this is one that I've also worried about quite a bit. It says. Um, why, you know, discuss the definition of major bleeding in TAVR. Um, and sometimes the FAQs contradict each other. 
uh, you have FAQs that say there must be an overt source of bleeding, and you have FAQs that say state that other bleed or access bleed should be captured if there's a drop in hemoglobin of greater than three grams or a transfusion of two units of red blood cells. So it's, I, the point is, I don't see how you can publicly report on a measure that participants are not abstracting, abstracting apples to apples. We've actually discussed this before, nor has measure bleeding been included in any of the metrics in the executive summary. So how, how uh, uh, you know, how are participants to be aware of this? Shriek, this is a, I think this is a great, I have to be honest with you, I think this is a great question. This is from uh, Judita Gorman, who just uh, really nicely has, has asked this question. Shriek, what do you think? Yeah, so a co couple points. I think we'll take it as good feedback in terms of being able to give the feedback to sites in the um, uh, in their reports. Um, so, so I think that's a, a, a very good comment um, because I think sites would want to be able to see that component of their um, composite score. The, the second piece about the definition uh, sounds like we need to give a little clarity, but it's mo mostly the definition is meant to avoid picking up chronic anemia. So there are certainly situations in which after either surgery or a procedure, a patient is given a blood transfusion, mostly because it's convenient to do so to treat chronic anemia. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. So that's that comment about overt bleeding. Now, presumably one is not giving three units of uh, blood for chronic anemia in the setting of, of TABR, but, but it sounds like we could do better with, um, with uh, clarifying uh, the intent there. Great, thanks. Another question that's come up a couple of times, Shriek, and we'll just stay with you for a second on this, but I want Barb to th be thinking about this also in Joan uh, from ACC. Can the AUC criteria data points be added to the basic data set? And where does AUC fit in to the data set that's collected? Trust me, for the person who asked this question, we have talked about this in detail amongst our executive calls, but I want Shriek to maybe uh, answer this as far as the basic data set, and then maybe Barb, you and Joan can comment uh, a little bit from the ACC side. So Shriek? Yeah, so I, my, my take on this is, first of all, the answer to the question logistically is, of course, it, it can be. I think the debate that we and many on this call have been having is uh, the AUC as they exist now um, are several years old um, and they predate the what I'd call kind of current phase of TABR with low risk uh, patients. And so the question is what is the best way to be able to apply um, those kind of criteria or should we be waiting for the presence of new criteria? And I would say this is, you know, uh, in my opinion, an open question still, you know. Yeah, Barb, what, your, what are your thoughts about yeah, this? And I think until we can answer that question, we need to kind of hold off on, on developing those metrics. Uh, I think it has always been the intent to provide that level of information back to our facilities. We know that's very been very helpful, particularly in like our CAP PCI registry. So that is the goal. Uh, but I think there are still these questions that need to be answered before we really dig in and um, and start developing those metrics for reporting. Yeah, Joan, anything to add to that? No, I, I we are getting a lot of questions about AUC, and I think we just need to make sure we're launching it with the uh, most up to date, uh, you know, data elements, especially with the new valve guidelines coming out and all. Yeah, John and I are going to be reaching out to the ACC president. Uh, we're crafting some emails for people to review so that we can try to have some uh, with, who, to Dipti, who's a new ACC president, to figure out whether a, a revision of the ACC would be something that's important. I know Mike Mack, I, and others on this call uh, were um, part of the original TAVR AUC, but maybe it's, it's somewhat, Mike, what you say, it's a little bit outdated at this point because I don't think we had lower intermediate risk patients uh, at that time we're not very well vetted out for that. Mike? No, oh, we agree totally. It is out of date. Okay, good. So um, another question that's come up, um, there are some questions about specific about COVID, John, um, specifically about how to do patients who have died afterwards and stuff. I think we'll leave that for ACC and Joan and, John, uh, and SDS to answer um, a little bit more in detail as they come up. But there have been a, a couple of questions specifically about how to manage COVID patients post-op um, if they've died. And that's something that we'll have them answer that. Um, one question that's come up, and I think that this is important, I'd like Shriek and David to answer this. 
what are the advantages and disadvantages of public reporting? So David, do you want to give a, a, an answer and Shriek, you want to go next? Sure. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a good high level question. You know, what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of public reporting? David? Well, in STS, when you go to our website, you'll see we, we state quite clearly that by public reporting, uh, we fulfill the ethical obligation of allowing patients to know uh, some more information about providers they may be considering. Um, and this is the, the ethical principle of, of, of autonomy. Now, some will argue, well, patients don't use it, uh, and whether they use it or not, we feel we have an obligation uh, to provide it. Uh, there are data um, uh, from multiple public reporting states in cardiac surgery, but most notably my state of Massachusetts and also uh, New York state uh, where um, results have improved dramatically uh, after the institution of public reporting. Uh, on the opposite side, there are those who uh, argue uh, that risk aversion uh, is a problem, that in a public reporting environment, uh, people are less willing to take on high-risk cases. The evidence for that, uh, although the first paper actually came out of cardiac surgery, the overall evidence of cardiac surgery for that is actually pretty weak. It is much stronger in PCI, particularly for um, acute MIs with uh, unknown neurologic status. Um, it, I, I think that the important thing that's often forgotten in the discussion about risk aversion though, and it's been corroborated in multiple studies in cardiac surgery, and I think several in PCI as well, is that in a public reporting environment, patients may be, high risk patients might be turned down uh, by less experienced or smaller programs but they're, they're accepted by more capable or experienced programs. And that's exactly, uh, I would argue, what we want to have happen. Routine cases uh, taken care of uh, in smaller institutions, uh, but the higher risk patients get shifted to the tertiary and quaternary centers. Yeah, Shri? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that was a great explanation from, frankly, the world expert in this area. The only thing I will add is that when we have heard from at least patient representatives at stakeholder meetings and so on and so forth, there is a, um, a great yearning for access um, to, to this type of data. And I, and I think you see it um, reflected in, in um, policy decisions that are along the same lines. We're all, all of us on this call right now are dealing with 21st century cures and uh, having um, data elements in our EHR is immediately available to patients. And it's reflective of, of the sort of public um, uh, request for access to these type of healthcare data. Thanks, I think that was great. Um, uh, Kim, I wanna just turn to you a little bit for a question. And one of the things that uh, Shriek uh, flew by and talked a little bit about right before the session that you were doing with him was the Michigan data set, Michigan sites. Um, choosing to do um, all the comprehensive component of it. What have you seen amongst the sites that, are, that you, you, you have a great kind of an idea of what's happening on a national level? What have you seen and what, what's your experience? Are most people going to do what the state of Michigan's doing? Or how, you know, tell us a little bit more uh, about the sites themselves and what you've heard amongst all the people you speak to. Yes, I, I, think, I think the reality is, is it's resource dependent. So sites that, that already have resources in place and are, and are, are uh, with relative ease doing the full data set might be more likely to do so. And uh, say sites that might be just starting out and still trying to find their way of exactly what amount of resources they need to run a, a successful program are most likely uh, turning towards the basic. And that's been what I've, been what I've heard. Um, along those same lines, I've heard examples of sites that are doing basic because they've had a tremendous uptick in volume especially now that we're recovering a little bit from COVID and can't keep up with the full, with the wow. full data yeah. set. Uh, and so have gone to just the basic because that's all they can manage at this time. Uh, and again, specific to resources, I've had sites comment that have said, you know, our EMRs are not as advanced. Um, to, there's a, it's a lot of, of, of uh, labor 
to get things faxed and calls and as opposed to a more interoperable um, EMR system and, and maybe waiting for that to be put in place before committing to the full consistently. Aside from that, I have heard some sites that much like Michigan are yes, sticking with the full um, because they wanna do that more uh, advanced higher level um, quality improvement projects regionally or at the site level. Uh, and at academic centers like, like, like ours, we like that repository of data for uh, local projects and, and papers and things that folks are working on. Um, and then there have been sites that just feel that it's an academic mission to, to stick to the full set. But I think it, it, it mostly it's, it's resource dependent. That's, what uh, I that's hope, great. though, is uh, what I hope, though, is with with this and with public reporting, I'm hoping that it's going to push it to a higher level in, administratively, um, to where administrators are going to say, "Hey, this is this is really important." Uh, it, whether it be important because of public reporting or or because of CMS requirements, this is important data to be collected. Therefore, we it's in our best interest to provide the resources to collect that data. Yeah, that's great, Kim. That's a very uh, very well put answer. Mike, I'm gonna ask you a question a little bit on the mitos. It's not on the NCD necessarily, but it says here that TAVR uh, does not require a walk test or at follow-up, but really for TMVR and the CLIP, they do. And why is that? Why, why is that important to, to walk test and uh, all, all that stuff at, at later, later down the road? Why is that important? Is that important for mitral disease compared to TAVR disease? Because we no longer require that for the TAVR sessions. Well, I think with uh, <clears throat> I think you have to look at there two different stages of uh, experience uh, and adoption of procedures, and as the uh, a lot of the information that you gather earlier in the stage of evolution of a procedure um, becomes less important as you gain more experience and become more knowledgeable above this. This was a lot of the drive between behind making the TAVR a more parsimonious data set. And the fact that Mitral is a number of years behind it, it will be more comprehensive. Yeah. Secondly, um, you know, I think both the uh, walk test as well as the uh, KCCQ are heart failure measurements. And heart failure is a much more common problem with mitral valve disease than it is with aortic valve disease. Uh, and quality of life and functional outcomes are, are um, in many ways uh, just as important as uh, mortality here. So I think for the foreseeable future, uh, you know, we will continue to see that not only uh, with mitral, but the upcoming tricuspid. Um, Sreek, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Mike, thanks. I, I would just say that, um, you know, I think if you look at the two ends of the spectrum, we have TAVR, which is fairly mature, and then we have tricuspid, which we're just really in the very beginning stage. And mitral is really in between where it's quite difficult, uh, right? There's multiple strategies, multiple device types, et cetera. And so we are, I think, looking at all of these things very actively. The, the walk test was, a, um, was really a, um, uh, a spot of intense debate for exactly the reasons that prompted the question and for the reasons that Mike went through for keeping it. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's something we're, we're looking at very closely and it, it may end up being something that, um, that in the long run won't be in the basic data set um, because we're trying to balance exactly what, what we've been hearing from you all, the difficulties in obtaining it versus the importance of knowing uh, some of these data elements in a setting where we don't have fully the uh, understanding of the, of, of the procedure and 10 years of experience with it. So Shriek, uh, Shriek and, and David and Sean O'Brien, there are different manuscripts that are that are being written for this. Can you update, because we've gotten maybe five or six questions about the public reporting methodology uh, paper and the lean data set uh, paper. Can, can you guys update us on where they are in their status, please? Yeah, so the, the, um, the, the 30 day composite metric, which is the one everyone's talking about here, that paper is in press. Um, at circulation. Sure. Um, we will need to see what we can do about having some version of that methodology on the society web pages. Um, you know, uh, yeah, because not everybody has full access to these right. publications unless you're in a large medical center. That's not right. everybody has subscriptions that, uh, to, a, to those. That's exactly right. And then and then the timing, right? There's some 
issues around can we do that before it's actually in, in, in print. But, but certainly we wanna make that accessible to everyone. Uh, we wanna be very transparent about that. Yep. As far as the, the process of the, the data elements, um, we have a, a similar situation there. We have a, a manuscript that it's not in press yet, but is fully drafted and is going some, some um, revisions basically. But again, we wanna be fully transparent about that, put that on the websites as well so that everyone can see you know, the elements. For those that are interested in knowing which elements go into the basic data set versus the comprehensive for TAVR and as they come out for mitral and tricuspid, I mean, uh, we the, the professional societies have the, the DCF form with the elements highlighted. Um, so that can can be uh, given to you. We can get those. To yeah, I think Carol just uh, uh, sent me a, a little chat saying that we have the companion guide and it'll be on the TBT website and she'll post a link for that. Carol, is that is that correct? Right. Sorry, Dr. Threnny, I'll post it now. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, I'm just, you know, we're, uh, John, it's okay. if it's four o'clock, maybe we'll just do another couple of questions. Does that seem reasonable? Could I do a, um, a PSA real quick before we lose folks? This do it. Good. Joe, it's um, all yours. Uh, not to burden Dr. Mike with all the mitral questions and, and thanks, Shriek, for helping. I want to perhaps give this to Kim. Could you please announce, we're getting a lot of questions about what is medical therapy, um, the terminology, the nomenclature, what is a heart failure specialist? Yeah. And all of those questions will be very nicely answered by uh, Dr. Sloan and her team. When, Kim, when is the ABC's uh, webinar going to be concentrating on mitral? Do you know? Thank you, Joan. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're very excited to have that from the CV team uh, under the direction of Patricia Keegan. And uh, I believe the date is April 20th. I think it's at 6 p.m. Um, but certainly we can post that as well on the TVT website and we hope everyone can join us. Thanks, yeah, there's, thanks. There's Lots a lot of, of questions. My trope, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of questions on who's, you know, I was gonna turn that over to Mike, who's a heart failure specialist, but if we're gonna have something on that, that'd be great. Um, so, um, John, I think it's uh, 401. Does anybody, I'll just open this up amongst all the panelists uh, uh, between David and Kim and John and Shriek, Mike, Mag, Barb, Sean, Joan, and Carol. Any questions that you want to ask of each other uh, as we kind of wrap this up? I'm, I'm so pr happy to say, John, we've, have over, we've had over 500, 600 people on this call with d uh, dozens and dozens of questions, over 100 questions. So I'll ask one with Shriek about the new data set that has a reduced number of elements. Um, there have been many publications from the TVT registry data that have looked at um, patients not included in the pivotal trials, um, helped expand indications. Um, we've really created with everyone on this call's input, a learning healthcare environment. Um, do you think uh, going to a smaller data set will compromise that, or do you still see the ability to gain new knowledge and to improve our, the quality of care with this uh, basic data set? That's a great question, John. So um, I think that uh, where we can retain that capability is in sort of hypothesis guided questions. So for example, people, let's say that um, we did not have distal protection as one of our data elements in the registry. And that was true at a point in time. And then this question came up as to whether distal protection could be useful or not. And that data element was added because it was an important question and we needed to understand it. And so I really want people to take home the idea that yes, we are trying to create a, a streamlined data set in TAVR where we have a relatively mature field, that does not mean that that data set is fixed, right? As questions come up in the field that need answering, we can be nimble enough to introduce appropriate data fields and answer those questions. So I do want to ask, uh, John, one more question of Mike Mack and David Shaheen. So just be thinking, if both of you think about this, Mike, because you've uh, been running a lot of trials Together, we've been running a lot of trials in the U.S. on these randomized side, uh, on the randomized side, and David, because this is about uh, public reporting. Diane asked a good question: How can TBT be more reflective of outcomes compared to the published literature? In TBT, a ninety percent bar means that you have zero bad outcomes. That's not consistent with the published literature. 
especially the randomized trials that we did. So how, how are we expecting people that hit a 90% bar to get, get a good score when that's not even what the published literature did? And why, why are we putting the bar so high? David, are you still on? All right, then I'll, I think I saw David jump, uh, fall off. Shriek, how about you answering that one then? Yeah, so a, a couple of points that I would make about it. Um, number one, what's in the published literature um, reflects care in the setting of uh, two things, at least. One, a very pers uh, prospectively prescribed clinical trial, which is usually not reflective of real world practice. And number two, if we're talking about the published literature of high risk um, TAVR patients or prohibitive risk TAVR patients, that was nearly 10 years ago. I think it's absolutely reasonable to expect that we're better now than we were 10 years ago. Um, and so th those would be at least two of the reasons that I would give to say it's very difficult at times to compare what happens in the real world to what's in published literature from randomized controlled trials. Mike, how, how do you see things similarly or dissimilarly? No, I agree with Shriek, and you're going to force me to answer the heart failure question here. You know, with any with any uh, uh, pivotal trial, you have to uh, understand whether it's generalizable to the real world or not, because you're treating these selected patients under optimal conditions. And one of the things we learned in the co there's been a lot of um, explanations as to why COAP and Mitra FR had different results. And one of those was the level of baseline medical therapy. One of the things we learned from COAP is that if you optimize guideline-directed medical therapy, the MR goes away a lot of times, and they don't need a mitra clip. So CMS put all the criteria in there so that the real world looked more like COAP than mitra FR. And the concern is that unless we adhere as closely as possible to the conditions that were created in COAPT, the outcomes are going to be like MITRA FR, no benefit to MITRA CLIP. Now, we, there's also extensive heart failure literature that when a patient is referred to a heart failure specialist, only 21% of those patients really are on optimal guideline directed medical therapy. And then you further add into this the fact that since COAPT and Mitra FR were done, we've got multiple new heart failure agents that are changing the heart failure world, including Entresto and SGLT2 inhibitors. So um, it is important to, to strive to get the results of COAPT as much as possible and to truly optimize guideline-directed medical therapy so that the world looks like the results of one trial and not the other trial. Yeah, Mike, the only thing I would say that the caveat to that is that you have a well-oiled machinery that allows a patient with valve severe valvular disease potentially to be seen by heart failure, not three months later, not four months later, but within a rapid time period. Because I think that's something that sometimes they get lost. I think that's where we as physicians need to do a better job at is that it can't, it can't just go, it can't be a year in the process of figuring this out. It's got to be somewhere where you call the heart failure specialist you try to get them in in the next week or so from your clinic, not, oh yeah, we'll see them three months from now. I think that was a that was something that we haven't done very well um, and need to work on more. And, and just a caveat, there's only 1,100 heart failure specialists in the country, so there's not enough to go around, but there's a right. lot of cardiologists that specialize in heart failure, though they right. may not be certified. And, and those, those are the individuals that need to be involved with the care of the patient. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, John, I think that uh, maybe we'll thank, uh, first of all, um, uh, Joan and Carol uh, from SDS and ACC, who have been absolutely phenomenal, allowing us to put this together and have done a uh, majority of the work for this. We've just kind of shown up and, and enjoyed this uh, hour and 15 minute conversation. Also, I want to thank uh, Kim and Shriek and Barb and Sean, uh, O'Brien and David. It sounds like David's uh, uh, already signed off, but I want to thank all of our speakers because without you, we could have really not had the expertise that, we're, that we really need in order to try to grab, put our hand, put our hands a little bit around this huge, um, huge uh, idea of the TBT and, and, and for a special tavern and transcatheter valve therapies we're giving to everybody in the United States. So thank you to the STS and ACC, and please feel assured that we're going to answer your questions. It may take us a week or so, but we're going to answer your questions. So John, mm -hmm. I think that's it for my end. You know, this is Joan. I want to do one more PSA. 
we are on this oh. journey together. We learn a lot from obviously all of you. We also learn a lot from what folks are doing out there in the field. And we will be announcing a podcast that uh, our inaugural podcast that Dr. Sarani and Dr. Carroll have graciously agreed to co-host. We hope that this may turn into an ongoing uh, invite the expert, but I would see perhaps uh, Dr. Mack in your future talking more about mitral, shriek, and you know the, the subspecialty. The podcast will be coming up perhaps in the next month or so. We'll announce that, but stay tuned because your questions again will be answered and we're looking for good topics for that. Um, that conversation. Thanks, you know. That's great. Thanks, thanks, Joan. John, John, and I will work on getting our, our throat lozenges uh, together for that. So, okay, John, is that is that it? Is that a wrap for today? There we go. So, so there are over a hundred questions. Eighty-four of them have been answered. So, uh, some in this open discussion, some directly to the individuals, and uh, we want feedback. We want questions. We're here as part of a community with the goal of improving the care of our patients, improving the system of healthcare within the United States. And uh, by working together through these efforts that uh, have been uh, put together by the efforts of many two professional societies, along with collaborations with uh, companies that make these products, along with uh, collaboration with CMS and FDA, uh, it's really been um, an honor being part of this process and let us all go forward with the hope that we can uh, transform healthcare. Just think what transcatheter valve therapies have offered in the last 10 years and what major difference it has made. So uh, thank you all and for joining us uh, this afternoon and stay safe and take care. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys.